Today I'll be joined by author and host of Nat Geo's Wild Extraordinary Birder, Christian Cooper, to talk about his show and amazing new book, uh, memoir, Better Living Through Birding. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure to be here. Dean Congratulations Dean. on all of your success. One of the things I was thinking about um, when, I, when I first um, heard about the show is I wonder if he can still go to Central Park and bird without like people like running up to you for pictures and just scaring the birds away because they want to get that selfie? Well, one of the things you have to remember is I tend to go very, very early before most people are awake. So selfie that people helps. come out late. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, and then sometimes people come up and, you know, sometimes it's the New York thing because, you know, in New York, we tend not to acknowledge celebrity. It's part right. of our thing. You know, it's the, you, you may notice that, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal just walked by you, but you don't do anything about it. You right. just, you know, maybe smile a little. But then, you know, sometimes people come up and say something, and it's always very nice, and it's always very welcome, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice thing. For a person who has never considered birding, could you kind of talk about some different ways they can discover themselves? actually through, through birding? Sure. Um, one of the things that birding does, um, if you've never done it, is that it gets you outside of yourself. And you know, that was important to me as a kid when I was you know, a queer, nerdy, closeted kid. Um, and 10 years old. Yeah, I knew, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I started birding when I was about 10. I knew I was gay when I was about five. So, you know, all this is going on. And, you know, that, that was a hard place to be back in, 19, in the 1970s. Um, so when you're birding, you can't be in your own head. You can't right. be worrying about all, whatever your worries are, you know, whatever is getting you down or preoccupying you. You can't be thinking about that when you're birding. You've got to be focused on, okay, I've got to be alert to a certain kind of motion, or I've got to be listening for sounds that'll tell me where to focus. And as you focus outward, all those other things just kind of fall away, at least for a little while. And you're connecting with the larger world beyond you. And that is incredibly healing, and it makes you feel connected to something much bigger. It kind of forces you to be in the present. Yeah, forces you very much to be in, in the present and outside of yourself, to recognize that, okay, there's all this stuff, but there's all that stuff. Right. And birding, I think, because you've got to be focused on, okay, sight and sound, I've got to pay attention or I'm not going to see any birds, you know, that gets you focused. So that's a wonderful thing that birding can do for anybody. And if you've never done it, you know, it's open, it's accessible to everybody. Um, I don't care if you're in a wheelchair and you can, mm. you're homebound, you can go to your window and you can look out your window and see what birds come to your fire escape or to your backyard or whatever you've got. So you can burn anywhere. You can burn anywhere. Because I found myself as I was reading your book and, um, you know, as I take breaks to run errands, take my daughter to school and things like that, I was like looking around, you know, because in Baltimore, I felt like I just keep seeing the same bird over and over again, but I'm probably not looking close enough. Well, you'll be amazed. I mean, you know, lots of people walk through Central Park and they're like, and they're like New York City is just pigeons. And they have no idea what is going on around them, particularly during migration um, when birds funnel through Central Park in hordes, and they just don't know, they don't realize. So, and once you open up people's eyes to that, it's, it's funny because the pandemic did that. There's a lot of what we call pandemic birders, people who started birding during the COVID era. And it's wonderful it's that all these people have found birding. But when we run into them, uh, so often they say, I've been in Central Park for years and I had no idea until I started birding that all this was going on and now they're hooked. Uh, it's always beautiful when you can just discover different things um, about your own space when you play, when you pay closer attention. I, I think that's excellent. And it's why I think so many people will enjoy your show, right? I well, mean, I hope I, so, yes. I, I, I've only had the luxury of watching a couple of episodes, um, and I, I hope a lot of people tune in. But, I, you know, you don't realize how intense it is. When I, when I saw a bird being put to sleep, to test his fertility, my mom was blown. Yeah, I, I, mine too, <laughs> it's, so and can, I hope can, that comes can, across. Could you talk about that procedure? Sure, sure. Um, there's a, a, what we call an endemic bird, a bird found only in this one place, and it's called the iguaca, 
Um, it's a native Puerto Rican parrot, and um, the Puerto Ricans are trying desperately to save it because you know they've been hit with hurricanes and deforestation and so many things that have made it very hard for this parrot to survive. And one of the things that's making it hard for the parrot to survive is these parrots have a fertility issue. And so to help make sure that the parrot lives, because the parrot has almost become a symbol of Puerto Ricans and their tenacity and their determination to make their island work despite all the setbacks, despite all the hurricanes. So to help the parrot survive, one of the things they're doing is they're making sure that the males have got a good pair on them to make another set of babies. <laughs> right. And to do that, you've got to look inside the bird. So they send this little tiny microscope inside the bird and you're peering past air sacs to look at the, the testicles of an iguaca to see if this, this guy has, has a healthy pair of testicles. We can test for, for fertility, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that this animal is going to reproduce. And there are so many issues with extinction going on. Um, unfortunately, you haven't seen the Hawaii episode, but that's huge in the Hawaii episode. Hawaii has lost three quarters of their native birds. They've gone extinct already. Um, and that's for a variety of factors, all having to do with Westerners having come to Hawaii and brought invasive species, and like cats and diseases. And, so there are, it's a mess over there in Hawaii. Westerners fuck up everything. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, but, you know, again, for the Hawaiians, these animals are part of their mythology, and they want to save them. So they are fighting tooth and nail. That, that's what the title of the show, Extraordinary Birder, refers to. Not to mm, me, right. but to the biologists and just regular old birders who, are, who have dedicated themselves to protecting these birds and saving them and bringing them back. And, for example, in Hawaii, you know, some of the people I, I met who are moving mountains to try to sort of save the birds they have. Just so inspiring. So yeah, we do still have to worry about extinction, very much so, especially in an era of climate change. Um, because birds are, are our best indicator of climate change. So, like the old uh, metaphor of canary in a coal mine. There's a reason why people say that. Right. It's because they would take the canary down to the coal mine, it would mm -hmm. die from the fumes first, letting people know, time to get it out of here. Well, the birds are our best indicator. They are everywhere, they are visible, they are accessible to us, and they are trying to tell us something. Because here in North America, in my lifetime, since I started birding, we have lost one third of the birds in oh, North wow. America. Now I'm, now I'm talking about numbers. You know, right. So for example, if there were three billion birds in 1970, there are now two billion birds. One billion birds just gone. Mm. So that's trying to tell us something. So yeah, extinction is very much an issue. Um, the birds are trying to tell us, take care of your environment, do something about climate change, and that's on all of us to actually do something about it. We can't wait for the government. Yes, it's their job, but if we wait for the government to do it, we'll all be dead. So it's on all of us, ourselves, to take on the responsibility of doing something about climate change. That's wow, when you, when you talk about extinction, because I, I read a New York Times article a couple of years ago that says um, there's 1.5 million missing black men mm. like because of systemic racism, because of um, prison industrial complex and just how society works. Um, the, the parallel is amazing. Has, has there ever been um, a, a bird that you've wanted to see and you just never caught it? Oh, sure. Sure, we call that your holy grail bird. Oh, where? Uh, you know, where you're sort of like, hoping to see it one day, but you still haven't seen it. Or also another word for it is your nemesis bird. If there's a bird you've been trying to see and you keep missing it, for me it's probably a bird called a jeer falcon. It's mm. the biggest falcon in the world and it's a bird of the far north. But every once in a while one comes down south to like New York and when it has, I've chased it on Long Island, I've ch chased it in, West in Westchester, hoping to see it, and no, both times it got away, I missed it. Has so. any of your, your friends caught it? Or? Yeah, some of my friends have seen it. Now, do they just look at it, or do they snap pictures too? Uh, depends on the person. Okay. Some, some people, a lot more people these days are snapping pictures because the technology is getting, get, has gotten better, um, uh, lighter, um, cheaper, um, easier to use, um, but I'm old school. I like to be in the moment and, and focus on the experience. So I still use a pair of binoculars. Some people carry both. Some people these days just use a camera. So it's, you know, it really depends on how you bird. One thing um, I really, really, really uh, enjoy uh, about your book is it's something that 
I kind of struggle. I teach, I write memoir and I teach memoir too. Hmm. And when a lot of people decide to get into this genre, they want to stay on the outside of a story. They don't really want to go deep into it. And hmm. I think, um, I think you really, really, really went deep. And there was um, some some beautiful transformations throughout the course of the book. Was it difficult for you to put out? Sure, um, because I'm not a very confessional person. And since you've read the book, you know, I sort of pride myself on having a, to use a Star Trek reference, a very Vulcan demeanor. Mm -hmm. I don't like to act on emotion. I like to keep emotion on the inside. And yet I'm supposed to write a memoir. You gotta put it all out you there. Gotta, you gotta put it out you there. You gotta put it out there. So, and it's, my editors were fabulous about that. Cause there would be times when I'd sort of put something in a very, in very clinical Vulcan terms about what was happening. And they'd be like, go deeper. no, 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 we need you to go back in that a little <laughs> bit more deeply. And I'm like, no. And they're like, yes. And I'm like, no. You're not just like, going to yes. blow past this moment. Yeah, exactly. Or for you, you're not just going to fly past this moment. Exactly. <laughs> so they, they were very good about that. And, uh, you know, and particularly when I started writing about family and, and you know, when, when my family members, my mother, father, grandmother start dying off, mm -hmm. that was really hard to write. I mean, yeah, that was very hard. So it took a while and um, I had to sort of knuckle down, but I wanted to put you know, something honest on the page. So, so on the, what frustrated me about the book, um, and I would, I would love to hear your take on this, is I'm like, wow, this guy was a revolutionary person at Marvel, um, played a role in introducing um, the first gay character, North Star. North Star, yeah. North Star, I, and then Star Trek, and then on Star Trek as well. And then Star Trek, yeah. I, I, my my role in North Star was very minimal. I was the assistant editor on the issue of I that mean, comic but, book. I mean, but still, yeah, like yeah. you were that voice in the room. Sure. You yeah. were that you were that voice in the room. Um, a, a, as a black man, as a gay man, um, as a person who loves comics and who knew that there are millions of people all over the world who can be inspired by that, right? So you, you had that in you, and you went to Harvard, which is a, an amazing accomplishment and you are a fascinating person. So I'm thinking, I'm like, wow, how come I need some goofy lady in the park with her dog before I hear about this guy? And that, I'm like, this is the biggest problem with our system because the Bird Show should have been out years ago. But you know, that's true for so many people. I don't look at it that way. I look at it the other way. I'm, I'm like, I am incredibly privileged to be able to tell my story in my own wor words and have so many people read it. But there are so many people doing so many amazing things. Again, I've met them on, working on the show, who have, who contribute so many things to the world in big and small ways, and their story very often doesn't get told. And all the things I've done in my life, I didn't do them so that I could eventually write a memoir, I just did them because that's what I do. And the good thing about what happened with the incident is that it opened up some doors some, for me so that what I have always been doing, I now get to keep doing, but on a bigger platform so it reaches more people. I guess I, I say that, and I look at it that way, and I totally understand that, but I guess I look at it, I look at it the other way sometimes because I also work with a lot of young people who are gonna be inspired by this book, and they're gonna be inspired by your television show, and they're gonna be inspired by you, and I almost feel like how many people are, are being cheated out of meeting or understanding or learning about a Christian Cooper because, um, you know, a, a network or a publishing company or the, our greater society doesn't really see value in picking apart or showing the dynamics or the, 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 uh, multiple, the multiple beauties that exist inside of a person until something bad happens. And it, just, it frustrates me so much. I, I hear that. Um, I, I will share your frustration in terms of you know, sort of our, our culture's obsession with celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, for, for stupid reasons. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even know what a Kardashian was for <laughs> umpteen years, and I led a blessed existence <laughs> until someone finally, I said, what's a Kardashian? They looked at me like I had three heads. Um, and sadly, now I know. But, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that our culture exalts these days. And it's like, you know what? There are so many people doing amazing things. And that's one of the things I love about the show is I get to take some of those people and put what they're doing in front of the camera so that people know, like there's a blind birder in Puerto Rico. So that highlights for people, you know, you don't even have to be sighted. You can be blind and you can be a birder. That's one reason why we say birder instead of bird watcher. Um, you know, this guy birds solely by ear. This guy in the Rockaways who took it upon himself 
just as a volunteer to save the piping plover out in the rock and rockaways, and he's organized dozens of volunteers to do that. That's amazing, so I get to tell his story. So, you know, in our own ways, we can correct that. We can push forward the stories of people who are doing amazing things. Uh, uh, you have an opportunity to talk about birding and to open it up to like all of these different people is a, a way of moving the conversation forward. Um, sometimes, sometimes I wonder, um, are we, does that put us in a better place in, in having the conversation around, around race and race relation and how these things affect people? Birding, if birding puts us in a better place? No, not birding, but like to the reaction to what happened to you. Has oh. it, does that, has that, has that put us in a better place? I think it added to the conversation and I think it added something that was necessary to the conversation. Um, I think, and I, and I always say this over and over again, that incident was not about her. It was mm -hmm. about the racial bias that it revealed and how for a lot of, uh, particularly white people, because we as black people know, you know, we've experienced it, but a lot of people were clueless. They're like, ah, Obama was ele elected president. Right. We're all good now. And they don't realize just how deeply racial bias permeates our culture. And yet here it was for everybody to see in a city as liberal as New York with someone who didn't use any slur, but used the correct term African-American, and yet still this racial bias. Well, she had the language down. Yeah. It's almost like she had an app in her phone, like a How to Be Racist app. Just <laughs> say this, say this, and say that. Look, and then we're going to give somebody an idea. They're going to go and create it. No, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but the point is, you know, not her. The point is right. the racial bias. Absolutely. And I think bringing that racial bias, letting people understand that, that it's there was important, particularly because it bubbles up in ways that are far more important in our society as evidenced later that same day, when that racial bias made a police officer in Minneapolis, a white police officer, think it was okay for him to kneel on the neck of a black man until that man was dead. And for three other officers, or four, I forget how many, to stand around and not do anything as he did that. That's the racial bias. That's what we have to fight against. You know, the racial bias that perc percolates up in the fact that Washington, D.C., urban, largely black and brown population mm -hmm. has no representation, no voting representation in our political system, in Congress. And yet you go to rural, mostly white Wyoming with fewer people than Washington, D.C. You go to rural, mostly white Vermont with fewer people than Washington, D.C. And they both have two senators each right. in the Senate. But nobody's doing anything for statehood for Washington, D.C. Why is that? That's the racial bias at work. That's the racial bias we should focus on. Those are the things we can change. And that's what we should, you know, we should keep our eye on the prize. Uh -huh. Don't be distracted by her. Focus on the bias and how it bubbles up in these horrible ways that we can do something about. Absolutely. I, I feel like I'm, I'm at a place in, in my career where um, I'm sick of talking about race. I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of having the conversations. I'm sick of um, sick of the hot take on whatever just happened. Mm -hmm. But then the other part of me is like, well, you know, how do we get through these conversations? How do we get through these? How, how do we push? How do we move the ball forward if we're not having these conversations? And then you kind of get in, into this space where like, am I having these conversations? Is it going to do anything or like? It, get, it gets difficult. The thing for me, when I start to, because I think a lot of us feel that, when I start to feel I am sick of talking about this, I do something. Doing something instead of talking is such a great antidote. Absolutely. You know, I was out in Freeport, New York a month ago registering voters out there because Long Island is, is, could go red, could go blue, and you know, it could make the difference who, with who controls the house. We control who controls the house, that determines you know, who will vote to make Washington DC a state, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But you know, there are things we can do Absolutely. as individuals. Absolutely. And you know, instead of talking and blah, 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 you know, first and foremost, do what our ancestors shed blood for and vote. But you know, voting is not enough. Get your friends to vote, register other people to vote. You know, all of this stuff we can do as individuals, and I find when I get sick of talking, doing just makes me feel so much better. So I, I, can, I can talk to you about 
burns and these issues all day long, but I, I really, really feel like it's time for you to tell everyone um, where they can get your book and where they can tune into your new show. Oh, all right. Well, uh, the book is available everywhere. So, you know, in, in uh, major bookstores, independent bookstores, and, you know, through all the usual means online. Um, it's published by Random House. Um, the, uh, the show is on Nat Geo Wild cable channel on uh, Saturdays at 10 um, uh, Eastern. Uh, and also streamable anytime, all six episodes. There are six episodes to the show and all six episodes are streamable anytime on Disney Plus and Hulu. And we'll be tuning in, thank you. Oh, my pleasure.